Welcome to the Top Business Leaders Podcast. You'll learn how successful people just like you have grown their businesses, expanded their influence, and made money by writing a book. On each episode, you'll learn the inside secrets to help you create a book that can serve as a powerful marketing tool to skyrocket your business. I'm your host, Dan Janelle. I help thought leaders, business executives, and entrepreneurs write their books. To find out more and to download our show notes, go to topbusinessleaders.com. Welcome to Top Business Leaders Podcast. This is Dan Janelle, the author of Write Your Book in a Flash. Today, I'm with Diana Jones who is a top business consultant in New Zealand. Hello, Dan. It's good to be here with you. (laughs) Thank you very much. We're delighted to have you here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in business? There was a time when I was an academic in a university teaching to a master's degree program, and it was um, an applied degree. So I'd be working with graduate students as they did a placement in the city. This was particularly in Wellington City in New Zealand. And um, so I was alongside these business leaders and I was the academic supervisor of these graduates as they were doing an application of theory into practice. And of course these business leaders would say to me, what do you see in our organisation and what's going on and why, why do you think people are stressed here? And at the time I was highly opinionated and didn't hesitate. And so I'd say what I saw and then I thought, well this is a business opportunity for me. So I set about learning how to read the invisible dynamics in groups and um, that became a business initially as a trainer and then then as a leadership advisor. So I run leadership programs, I'm a business advisor, leadership advisor and I'm an executive coach. What kinds of companies do you work with? At present, mostly in New Zealand, large um, organisations, public sector organisations and not-for-profits. And you've written a book. I've written a book. I loved writing my book. (laughs) Let's talk about how the book helped you with your business. How long has the book been out? It came out in May 2017. And right now we're in, what month is this? This is April of 2018, so it's been a year. 2019. two years. Thank you. two years. (laughs) So the international date line uh, goes only by days, not by years. The 16 hours difference between our (laughs) countries has got huge significance. (laughs) (laughs) Certainly. Okay, so it's been about two years. How has your business changed in two years because of your book? Um, Quite significantly, so my book Leadership Material, How Personal Experience Shapes Executive Presence, um, it's been their work that I've been doing over the last 10 years, really assisting executives who are either invisible or in the background, how to become more influential and impact people and by their by their presence. So I wrote, was basically writing of my work of the last 10 years, so how has it helped my business? So. Um, People enjoy reading the book because they identify with the stories in the book. They can see themselves as some of the executives. So I've used a lot of stories and a lot of case studies in the book. And many executives say to me, um, you're telling my story, this was me, um, or I wish you were around when I was the national leader in a particular area. Um, there was, were not coaches like you around. So people can see themselves and they can see possibilities. And um, so clients have wanted to work with me. So it's been a fantastic um, leverage for me to get my story and my work for more people to be familiar with what I do and how how the impact of that. How did people find out about the book? Um, It has got a quite, it was published in the States, and so it's got a um, big spread in the States. It's on Amazon. Um, People talk about it and talk about my work. And of course, I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook and so people find out so word the, of mouth. So, mm. so the book has actually led to more business, just over the transom business from people you didn't know before. Yes, it's as if it's as if more people know about my work and the way that I work, which is not so traditional because I am mostly working in the area of behaviour change of individuals and groups. You said you used LinkedIn to promote your book. How did you do that? Um, Lots of people took photographs of the book, <laughs> and um, out of the blue, there'd be like someone would have a series of six books they were going to read over the summer, and mine, mine was in there. So, um, or people would um, have my book and take a photograph of themselves with my book, either reading my book or talking about my book. So it was um, I didn't intentionally do that, but that was one of the effects of um, 
the book and so someone um, from India saw my book and started sharing the posts about it so it was and that happened from people all over the world so it became known wow that's amazing it was very amazing it's been very delightful very very gratifying did you do any proactive marketing of your book by say perhaps sending it to a CEO that you wanted to work with well, I was lucky in New Zealand. Um, the, obviously, New Zealand compared to the States is quite a small country. We're a country of uh, 400,000. And I had a chance to give every chief executive in the public sector a copy of my book. So it became um, spread out throughout the public sector particularly. And then I've given a lot of copies to various people. But I did, I did have a marketing plan. It was part of actually writing the book um, with my publisher was to have a marketing plan. And one of the things I did was to write a number of articles that were published or quoted in Forbes magazine and the Huffington Post and CEO magazine. So I was very lucky to have opportunities to for my work to be reflected for, through those magazines and publications. How did your individual outreach to CEOs work, you know, tactically? What did you do step by step to reach them? Um, well, I'm quite well known in some sectors in New Zealand. So it was more following up with particular people and um, or them making contact with me. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about writing your book. Yeah, I'd uh, love to talk about writing <laughs> my book. Really okay. I should almost let you get started and you <laughs> let you take it from there. But I know you have so much content, as do a lot of people who are listening to this podcast. How do you decide what to keep in the book and what to leave out of the book? Um, that was not such a um, difficult decision for me because I had a structure that I wanted to use in each chapter and um, so I'd have a principle I'd, I wanted to work with, I'd have statistics and then I'd have some stories and case studies that would reflect and then I wanted to write my thoughts and um, the content that I wanted. So I was able to stick with that structure. and. Um, and I was lucky enough to have many, many stories. Like each executive I asked if they were willing for me to share their story, said yes. Um, but there was a, like a, there was more to it than that because my publisher wanted me to have a signed document that it was okay to use the story, and that people were okay with what I'd written. So I also shared with each person what I'd written, the way I'd written their story, because it was very important that they didn't get recognised through the story so some of the case studies are composite and so I took some time and care so that the main theme of the story is in there but the actual real identity of the person is not. What did you learn from writing the book as uh, in terms of writing style and being organized what did you wish you knew after you had written the book that you had written when well, you started? I think I was lucky enough to be in a forum with a number of other authors so I had some really good guidelines what I decided to do was to write every day to produce so many words, like so I'm going to write a 60,000 word book, so I knew how many words I needed to write each month and how many words I needed to write basically each week. And so I had a chart up on my wall, like with segments on it, so I could <laughs> look at how many thousand words I was doing. Um, and I'd get up at 6.30 in the morning and I'd write until 11, and then I'd go about and do my daily life and my business. I made one commitment, which was that every interaction I would have would help me write my book. And that was a very, very helpful decision or principle to have as I was writing. So I just kept that discipline. Um, and about chapter five, I completely ran out of steam and um, happened to have a family friend staying who was a playwright. <laughs> and I said to him, what do you do when you get writer's block? And he said, oh, you need to do some research. You need more input. And so um, I was lucky enough to make contact with a particular group that had access to enormous amount of research and I said I'd like information on this, this and this and this. So by the end of the day I had 25 papers in the different areas that um, I wanted to quote and refer to and it just stimulated me to keep on going. But I did have two particular experiences that I want to talk to you about while I was writing the book. One was that I had the content that I wanted to write, and so I would actually actively, things from my brain would come out of my pen, as it were, and I'd be writing this stuff. Um, that was really satisfying. And then I'd have a second experience quite often where I'd actually almost move my pen, I was handwriting this, 
over the paper and these words would flow out. It was the most extraordinary experience, as if like it was coming from my subconscious. And I'd think, oh my gosh, look at that, that's really good. <laughs> it was a very satisfying experience to have these two, like one almost like a technical expertise experience and the other was some subconscious process that I just so enjoyed and I was not sure each day who I was going to be writing, whether I was going to be the te- technocrat or whether I would be the creator. But the combination of that experience was really satisfying in writing. That's why I'm so delighted. And the other thing was I decided to write it in three months and I did and uh, that was deeply satisfying. So you wrote 60,000 words in three months. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. You mentioned that you one way you made it happen was that every interaction you had that day related to the book. Could you explain a little bit more about that? I'd love to because it was a really, really good decision. So I'd be writing or I've written for the day and I'd head out and I live in Wellington which is quite a small city and there was this particular day I was really grappling with this idea of how you uh, really say to someone, if you're a leader, how do you say to one of your team or a peer something that's really you want to say but you don't want to offend them or you don't want to mess up their lives or in an odd way you don't want to hurt them but you know you know there's something significant has to change and um, I walked into a client and we were talking and he said oh I just I don't know about this but I think I have to cross the line with one of my managers and I thought oh my gosh that is it you have to cross the line you do have to step across a line you do have to as it were interfere in someone's psychology and really say something that's really important and significant to you and to them. And so I wrote this whole chapter on crossing the line and the principles of it and and why you need to do that. But unless I'd met with that client, I don't think my thought or idea would have crystallized or clarified. It sounds like you started with an outline because you knew what you wanted to say, but you kept it flexible enough for these chance meetings and inspirational ideas. When I, when I did the book proposal, which was initial initially, with each chapter I wrote what the chapter was going to be about and then five bullet points that I would cover. And I actually stuck to that for the whole book. It was just, I mean, I did it probably, the outline, in maybe 40 minutes. <laughs> um, but, but it actually held true. There was a major change and very dramatic when I was about a third of the way through the book where I realised that my chapters 7 and 8 <laughs> needed to be chapters 3 and 4. <laughs> <laughs> and it, was, it took me a week to decide, would I make that change? Um, at this stage, I had all the pages of every chapter printed out and plastered all over my walls in my, my dining room. And so it meant moving 17 or 18 pages of writing um, from one part of the wall to the other, but I just knew it would flow better if I did to make the change. And after a week, I did to make the change, and just it became easier. When I work with my clients as a developmental editor, I find that that happens often. We start with the idea, but as we get deeper and deeper into it, we realize that this belongs here, that belongs there, or this one chapter morphs into something that's so much bigger that it really deserves to become two chapters. So that's that's a very normal part of the writing process. There was was another aspect that I'd like to talk with you about was my my book went off to the publisher and it was edited and um, there were many aspects of the editing but one was the editor, to my great annoyance, took out 5,000 words And um, there were some I wanted back in definitely because I didn't want the meaning and the intent to be changed or the tone to be changed. But it meant 5,000 words had gone. And so. Excuse me for a second. When you say 5,000 words, did they lop off part of a chapter or did they do deep editing of each sentence so that the the meaning of the sentence was suddenly changed to something different? Both. Okay, thank you for clarifying. So, first book, so I thought, oh, well, maybe this is what's happened. So, um, but I was on a bit of a roll, and so I wrote another chapter, and it has actually been one of the more powerful chapters where I'm talking about three particular words I, we, and you, and how leaders can use that for accountability, um, 
uh, invitation for action. There's so many functions, getting really personal, strong personal relationships for vision and direction. So I feel very, I was furious with the editor who I've never met. Um, and um, also incredibly grateful that it opened up this whole other area that um, I didn't know I was going to write about. Nice. Let's talk about the publishing process. How did you find a publisher? Um, luckily enough, um, I did my initial book proposal with Alan Weiss, and he um, undertook to introduce me to a number of agents. And so I found this fantastic agent, John Willick, who's in uh, the New York area. And he he's part of the book fair process in the States. And he found my publisher, and Alison Hankey, and um, Nicholas Brealey Business Books. So very lucky. And um, I just so enjoyed working with the both of them. They were terrific. Great, except for that editing experience. Um, uh, I do have to difference? say, the editor wasn't Alison, but someone, okay. someone their company uh, contracted to do the editing, the actual editing of the book. Yeah. Uh, l- l- let's put an end to that editing story. Did you win, or did you let them make their changes, or how did that work Well, there out? were some words in uh, our language in New Zealand that are completely different um, in the States. Um, so the second example that I will talk about, um, I wanted to talk about um, the terminology that the editor wanted to use was a kind of a male word to do with ships and sailing, which I didn't really want to utilise. When I'm talking about a milieu or your your basket of uh, expertise or experience, um, and the word that they used just didn't work for me, and. Um, so I was very firm about not using that. And I will talk about the first example. Um, in the United States, or in New Zealand, when we have that little dot at the end of sentence, it's called a full stop. In the States, it's called a period. And um, in our language, that is um, an anatomical function. And um, it wouldn't have sit, sat easily from anyone in the Southern Hemisphere reading that in uh, my book. So that was kind of a contentious point, but um, it was effectively made from my point of view. (laughs) Very good. When you sat, start, when you first sat down to write the book, did you have someone in mind that you were? Did you have a, what was your business purpose in writing the book? Was it crystal clear in your mind then? Um, Yes, I wanted to talk to my clients and future clients. And so they were in my mind. Um, And I also wanted to talk to anybody who's a leader, so not necessarily someone who's in, you know, like made it, as it were, in their careers, but people who are beginning, like community leaders, people who are leading in technical areas, so that they um, understood that leadership is not so much to do with skills, tools, and techniques. It is about how you tap into your life experience and really use what you've learned from your life experience. And therefore, it's mostly to do with relationships and behaviour as you produce business results. So I talk quite a lot on the, in the book about how people um, experience being with you, that that's quite a central feature of my book. And um, that's not to do with skills, tools and techniques. So I, w- I wanted to write to anybody who was interested in being a leader or who, who, who is a leader so that they could expand their idea. And of course, a lot of people have this idea anyway. It's not necessarily um, uh, just my idea. A lot of people tune into this. It just makes sense to them because it's part of their everyday experience. How has the book helped you in terms of getting new clients? What was your life before the book and what was your life after the book in terms of approaching a new person? Um, There's two things that come to mind. One is I feel I have a lot more content readily accessible that I can just share with clients. Um, the second is I feel like I'm already known um, when I meet with clients, like they know some things about me, they know how I think, they know what my principles are, they've, they've got an idea about me. Oh, and there is a third thing, I think you'll know this from your work and um, the clients that you work with, when you've written a book, um, people think, oh, that's, that's a good thing. Like, she's done quite a lot of work. She's drawn her thoughts together. She's worked out how to get them on paper and how to get them produced. And so 
it's um, it's something that people recognise that takes an effort and there's an appreciation of that that prior to writing the book I wasn't so conscious that, that people had that idea about me. Before you wrote the book, did you find that you were one of many people who were offering the same kind of service and after you wrote the book you stood out because of the book? I think so. I think that it has made that has made a difference. Yeah. Okay. Great. What other tips do you have for someone sitting down to write a book for the first time? Um, the thing that helped me most was this idea of having a structure. So for me, that was mapping out these, that I was going to write 10 chapters that have these principles in it, that I'd have this paragraph and these five bullet points. That gave me enormous freedom to kind of enter in. Like, other than that, there was a blank page. Um, but it gave me a structure to write in, because I, I tend to not be so systematic. So I'm... So that structure was enormously helpful to me. And um, I didn't ever doubt that I was going to be able to do it because of that structure. I knew the beginning, I knew the end, apart from the swapping of the chapters, which was like the internal dance of the book. Um, it, it, it felt possible at every step. Yeah. I love that term, the internal dance of the book. Yes, well, you don't know what's going to come out. That, that's the extraordinary thing. Like, you had, I had these five bullet points in each chapter, but when I wrote that, I had no idea what I was going to put under each of those bullet points. But as, you, as I began to write, I realised somewhere I had the idea. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing what happens when you sit down to write. I'm co-writing a book with a doctor now, and uh, we're turning Medicare and Medicare Advantage, which are typically very boring topics, but we want to get certain points out, so we decide to turn into a medical thriller. Yes. So, so I sit down, it's like, how would Samantha know about this, and how could we explain this kind of system so that people get exactly what they need to know without being bored? <laughs> it's amazing what your creativity can come up with in those situations. So we have chase scenes and we have whistleblowers and we have uh, sneaking into meetings and uh, it just it's just amazing what, what, what can come into your mind. It's very exciting. I've, I've just read Bad Blood, the um, Elizabeth Holmes uh, Theranos story. Oh yeah. And that's like reading a thriller. You know, yeah. and I just go, how come they didn't know this? How come they couldn't see this? It was, it was uh, yes. Yeah, it's great that you're doing that. Yeah. yeah. One question that has just been boggling me since you mentioned it is you hand wrote your entire book. How did you get it into the computer? Did you retype it? Did you hire yes. someone? Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, was that a revi did you revise as you were writing or to just word for word? I didn't revise. So I had really strong um, advice not to self-edit. and. What I realised, so I got up early, I think I said I started at 6.30 in the morning, so I'd get up at 6, my uh, partner would make me a cup of coffee, and I'd sit down and write, and what was so valuable in that is that I, I discovered that my critic does not wake up till about 11 o'clock, <laughs> so I could write freely for those hours in that time. But I found if I uh, started to read it and edit it, um, I would just get into a mess. So I didn't edit it. Um, I knew it was going to be edited. I had this probably one of the best editors in Alison, and um, I knew that she would give me guidance. And so when I sent her chapters, um, I noticed that she wasn't commenting about my writing. There were certain things she wanted me to emphasize, which um, I, I did do that. Um, but she wasn't commenting on the nature of my writing, so I thought, oh, well, it must be okay. Did, did she send you comments back and forth for each chapter or after the entire book was done? Um, I think I sent her the first three chapters, and mm -hmm. there's a saying she, she wanted me to bring out more of my experience and more of my thoughts and ideas as I was writing. And so that was the main guidance that she'd given me. Great. Any other final words of wisdom about how to write the book? Well, um, I'm thinking about writing a second book now. Okay. <laughs> and um, um, I'm hesitating a, a little. Um, 
and just in deciding on the precise area that's going to be valuable because I'm writing in the area of leadership and I think internationally there's not been a lot of fantastic examples of leadership. I think we've seen an enormous failure of leadership in both businesses and politically and um, so I've hesitated um, significantly about writing again but there have been various events in the world and in businesses and I know from my own work that there are many leaders doing absolutely fantastic work and so I'm wanting to write about those, I'm wanting to tell those stories and to bring the principles out from those stories. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with our with us today. I'm Dan Janelle, the host of Top Business Leaders, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Dan. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for listening to Top Business Leaders, the only podcast that shows you exactly how people just like you have built their businesses by writing a book. If you'd like to write your book but don't know where to start, you can find great information at writeyourbookinaflash.com. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another insightful interview to help you become a top business leader.